This is the word of the Lord. Nothing like a little bit of uh, religious extremism for a Sunday morning, right? <laughs> In our world, extremism is usually linked to uh, religious inclinations that promote violence and terrorism. But it need not be the case, of course. You could be extremely gracious. You could be extremely generous. You could be extremely forgiving. You could be extremely faithful, extremely kind. In short, you could be extremely like Jesus. See, everything is not equal, I don't think. Everything is not the same as each other. In our culture, where language is becoming increasingly absolute, we, we kind of lean into our words and make them sound more important, uh, but our beliefs are becoming more and more relative, I reckon, and it's tempting to consider one thing as about the same as the next thing. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, and opinions are becoming more opinionated, yet as one gets a, one gets a sense that the substance often isn't in the opinions. It's kind of lacking. Even when they're vigorously espoused and defended, there's a kind of a melange of furious outrage and one person's rant seems much like the next person's rant, even if they take different positions on a topic. And we get it, right? Everybody's upset about something. Nothing's quite good enough. Complaining is easy. In our world, where so many leaders model merely a kind of mealy-mouth grasping insecurity, and make those around them pay for their agendas, Jesus is not like everyone else. Everyone is not equal. Every way is not the same. Jesus really is quite unique, and his ways stand our assumptions on their head. So in what way would you say Jesus is unique? Well, of course, there's a mystery surrounding his father, but that hardly makes him one of a kind. He was a carpenter. There's always been plenty of those around. Uh, Jesus had unique insight into the scripture and his faith tradition. But there's always been rabbis and preachers, of which that might be said. Some of us have named him the Son of God, and we don't bandy that title around lightly, do we? Yet even that is more a recognition of uniqueness rather than a description of the way in which he is unique. I think Jesus was unique in that rather than navigating his life and his relationships and culture so that everything worked best for himself, his life orientation was much larger. Jesus was motivated and directed by the call of his father. At every step, something much larger than merely seeking his own best interests was going on for him. Jesus really did live for others, not in a doormat sort of way, not as one who had no centre himself. Jesus did not need to serve other people in order to reinforce a sense of who he was. Jesus appreciated the innate image of God which he recognised in every person he encountered. He was ready and willing to give everything to see people set free to live into that God-likeness. And Jesus also recognised fairly early on that this was not going to be an easy path for him. He knew that he would come against the established culture, the ways that held people in particular patterns and rejected others as outsiders, the ways that are fueled by fear and strive for power over. Even family systems can be like this. We fall in line with the system we are born into, and Jesus' challenge is to the deepest level of our assumed allegiances. We are to be ready to contravene even our family, that system that formed us and holds us, should it conflict with the way of Jesus' way of grace and truth. And it will. 
It always does. Our systems are expressions of who we are, and like us, they display the same self-preservation tendencies and biases. Any threat to these systems and their ways will draw reaction to shut down the threat with force if necessary. And when that happens, which will you choose? The family way or Jesus' way? And Jesus doesn't hedge, does he? He's not mealy-mouthed. He's not soft about it. He knew exactly what he was doing and exactly what he was asking of anyone who should decide to follow him. In other places, Jesus made clear that following him would cost everything. There's a passage in Matthew 10 where he says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he become like his teacher or a slave like his master. If they call the head of the house Beelzebul, which is what they called Jesus, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Like he said, if they're doing this to me, they're going to do that and worse to you. Jesus' earthly ministry ended with his death on a cross. And we are to soberly reflect on this reality. The way of Christ is not about worldly ease and prosperity. It is about a fundamental confrontation of allegiance. Allegiance to Jesus means gracious acceptance of all. And those who align to the world's way will abandon any who do not align with them. Are you ready for that confrontation? And Jesus was talking to a large crowd, many of who just hung around. And, you know, in a funny kind of way, dreams are free. Uh, you can think that you are something, but it's not until it really starts to get real that it becomes a thing. Uh, and Jesus talks about building a tower, or maybe better for us, a home renovation. If you're planning to renovate your home, do you dream large without regard to your budget? If you take that approach, you will never manage to renovate your home. Should you be foolish enough to begin knocking down some of the walls, you may not have the budget to build the new ones that are required. Or in another way, I remember when I was in high school, it's a long time ago now, and I wanted to be a rock star. I really did. Uh, the challenge was my main instrument, or instrument was the recorder, and there weren't that many rock star recorder players. So I decided I would purchase an electronic keyboard. In those days, Casio was the name, and I bought a, a fairly expensive Casio keyboard. It's like a synthesizer thing, and I thought, I'll learn how to play this. I joined with a group of friends. Who, one played guitar, another bass, another on the drums, and we even did a real gig at the local community hall, and we were not very good. <laughs> and I was the least good of all of them. <laughs> and I had no sticking power. It was a nice dream, but I didn't have what it took to actually sit down and do the music lessons and learn and be disciplined and get on with it. I was, however, foolish enough to fork out a fair bit of money on an electric keyboard along the way, which disappeared somewhere in my past. If you are serious about your renovation or indeed your music career, you will only take on as much as you can realistically achieve. You tailor your intent to fit your capacity and Jesus is challenging his casual audience to consider whether they have what it takes to be his disciple. Because discipleship is not a walk in the park. It's not all beer and Skittles. I'm not even sure what Skittles are in that context, but surely not those sweets, right? No, anyway. Uh, it's not all easy. And it's sometimes far from fun. We do no service to anyone if we misrepresent the challenge associated with following Christ. And just as importantly, we are fools if we misrepresent the reality of discipleship to ourselves, which we can do. As I've often said here in other places, the thing about being a fool is nobody sets out to be a fool. It just kind of shows up along the way. We do what we do because we convince ourselves that it's the best thing for us. 
But misrepresenting things to others or indeed to ourselves is always foolish. It may soften the immediate sting, you know, make it sound like it's really fun and good or whatever, but to pretend something is other than what it is is foolish because truth persists. No matter how much effort is applied to bury the facts or distract us from important details, truth has a permanence. It has a permanence that deception cannot maintain. No matter uh, how we might work at it, in a sense. There's a lovely uh, thing about the etymology of the Greek word for truth. It's a lay face. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you, but it comes from the word latho, which means to escape notice. But it has an ah on the front, which means to not be able to escape notice. Truth is that thing which you can't escape noticing. And it's only the fool who believes they can maintain the deception such that truth will never emerge. And Jesus says, don't be that fool. Be honest with yourself and with others. Consider carefully the demands of discipleship. Don't fudge what is required. Only take it on if you believe you can see it through. But that's not the only thing to factor into this decision about following Jesus because whilst following Jesus does have a cost, so does the decision to not follow Jesus. Every choice has both its benefits and its costs. The challenge comes with deciding to live a life that renders the cost you pay worthy of that cost. It's not about bluffing ourselves and pretending it's better than it is, nor is it useful to frame it as holding your life together for as long as you can because things will somehow get better or something like that. The decision to follow Jesus may cause others to despise you, but the decision to not follow Jesus may result in you despising yourself. Because the way of Christ is not the way of the crowd. It is the way of losing your life and so finding your life in the self-giving way of Christ. Jesus makes it clear time and again we should not expect others to get this, to understand it, not even to respect it necessarily because the way of Christ is genuinely supernatural, which is to say it really doesn't make sense to our natural way of thinking. But the natural way is actually coming to an end for all of us. The world of our flesh is passing. It is not eternal. If we invest everything in this world, in this life now, in a short-term temporal bet, there will be no eternal dividend to our existence. In due course, we will experience our natural life ebbing away. We will become overcome by inevitable forces of the relentless march of time. Any of us over the age of 30 already get this. And it's a fight that you can't win. You cannot prevail. You will concede and it will destroy you. In due course, mortal life always succumbs to its mortality. The only startling thing about this is how difficult we find it is to accept it. There is a moment coming that no one is able to repel. We may be able to hold it off for a while, keeping ourselves fit, eating well, doing all those sorts of things, but in due course it will prevail. And Jesus is saying, come to terms. Now is the time. Work out what this all means. What is it that makes it all worth it? All of this, our life and our eventual inevitable death. Is it all just about you? Does this meaning start and finish just with you? Or is there something far larger, something that started well before you and will continue long after you shuffle off your mortal coil? Are you part of something larger? 
every day we make the choices to, that reveal how large is the life that we are living into. And I think the final line of the section that was read to us is perhaps the most difficult and the most telling. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. This is not just about the objects that we own. It is a sense of ownership that causes us to see ourselves as detached individuals. In the Gospel of John, Jesus addresses Simon Peter at the very end in a tone that I believe more adequately captures a sense of what Jesus is saying in this passage when he says, Truly I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. That's in John 21, 18. And it's not that Jesus imagines Peter being directed against his will, but that Peter is willing to submit to being led to where, left to his own devices, he would never choose to go. That's what it means to come to terms. In Hebrews 11, where the writer of that letter rattles off a list of heroes of the faith, people like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Rahab, Gideon, Samson, more and more. You know who I'm talking about, the heroes of the Old Testament as, it were, as they are. Each of them called in ways that challenged their natural inclinations, each one now immortalized in a story far bigger than any one of them. See, there is no room for compromise when it comes to recognizing Christ's preeminence. No one else can hold that central place, not your parents, not your children, not your partner, not your brothers or sisters. Jesus is unique. And following, following him has its cost, just as not following him has its cost. There is a cost either way, and we will decide to live the life that is worth the cost we pay. If we choose Jesus, it will cost us everything, and it will be worth everything. Yet, it does not work to do this in a half-hearted way. Discipleship is too challenging, and you simply won't make it. You have as much success as I did of being a rock star. You've got to give it everything. Consider carefully before you throw up your hands and give up the attempt because there's a cost to giving up as well. One you must consider before it's too late and Jesus makes it crystal clear. It is worth your everything to follow him. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, you don't mince your words. We thank you for your unique, the uniqueness of your call and that you invite us into an uncompromising life as we follow you. Help us to hear your spirit leading us each step of the way to the glory of your name. Amen. <laughs>